Did you all have a good Thanksgiving? Yes. Yes. Did you all give thanks good? Yep. Yes. Well. Thanks well, yes. <laughs> but that didn't work with the turn of phrase I was shooting for. Gooders. Gooders. <laughs> um, we are, believe it or not, at the start of the Christmas season, which I, I know that's hard to believe, you know, since they started putting decorations up in October. <laughs> um, but officially, we have begun the Christmas season. And I've decided this year, for building up to the Christmas season, I'm, I'm going to kind of go on traditional lines, non-traditionally, if you will. Um, we're going to follow the Advent calendar. The first week of Advent is given to the patriarchs, but, but more specifically, it's given to the prophecies of hope. And I want to talk today about the planning and the preparation that went into the first Christmas. So if you have your Bibles, flip open to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Because see, in order to understand the significance, in order to appreciate, fully grasp the significance of the birth of the Christ, we have to understand why. So we got to go back to the beginning. So in Genesis chapter 3, we see that God has created all things. He has taken man and woman. He has placed them in the garden. And He has called everything very good. And then, chapter 3, verse 1, we see the beginning of the problem. So verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. You know, the devil doesn't change his tricks. He always comes to this as an end with, did God really tell you that? Is that really what he meant? Did God really say? But look at number, or verse 4. First word in verse 4 is, but. The woman knew what God had said. As a matter of fact, you know, God had established a circle. It is safe outside of this circle and, and Adam and Eve took that circle and they expanded it so they wouldn't get into trouble. Because God said, don't eat of the fruit. They said, don't touch the fruit. Okay? And then in verse 4 it says, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, it's kind of amazing to me that he would give such an outrageous lie followed by a significant truth. Because, see, we get caught up in the truth and we kind of just bleep over the lie. It says, you will not surely die. Did the devil ever come up and just tell you a bold-faced lie to your face? Do you ever believe him? Yes. We all do, occasionally. It comes on us. Be why? Because we would rather believe the lie than the truth. Because the lie gives us something that we want. Okay? So, you will not surely die, but your eyes are going to be open. You'll be like God. Now, what was the first sin? Because it wasn't eating of the fruit. It was when Lucifer said, I will ascend to the mountain of the north and I will make myself like God. Okay? It was pride. And at the root of every sin is pride. It's the feeling that you deserve something more, something else, something other. And that's where all sin gets us in trouble. 
And he says, you know, he's, he's trying to insinuate into the woman his own desires because the devil wanted to be like God. He wanted to ascend to the highest of heights and be God. And God cast him down. So what does he do? He's going to get the, the, the human race to follow right in his path. And he says, uh, you will be like God. So verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Now folks, we got two problems here. <coughs> Woman, listen to the devil, and the man who was given the husbandry of all of creation, did not protect her. As a matter of fact, he followed her. He walked right after her. She's like, oh, this fruit is delicious. And he went, uh-huh. And he ate it. Okay? Man failed in his duty to be the God-given husband and caretaker. Woman failed in her duty to be the husband's help meet. And both fell. Okay? Why? Because they saw something they wanted. <coughs> then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So we're going to jump ahead now, because God comes into the garden, and he walks around and he calls out for Adam. Now did God not know where Adam was? Well, he knew where Adam was. God knows everything. I mean, how would you like to play hide and seek with God? <laughs> you know? You know, he just turns around. Okay, you're under the chair. You're in the closet. You're just standing out in the open because you couldn't find a spot. You know? But, but he goes to the garden. And he calls out Adam. He says, where are you? Why did he call out if he knew where he was? He was calling Adam. He wanted Adam to come forth. God already knew what happened. God wasn't like, oh my gosh! What have the fruits been eaten? Who did it? He knew exactly what was going on. He wanted man to come to him. See, it's always that way. God's desire is that we would come to him. God has already come so far. He has bridged the gap. But we have got to come that step toward him. Okay? Now, <clears throat> he calls out. And... Uh, <laughs> Adam's like, God, I was, I was afraid because I'm naked. I would be afraid too. <laughs> and God said, well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? He says, yes, but she made me. It's this woman you gave me, God. She's defective. She's defunct. It's her fault. And the woman, what the woman do? It was, Snake. <laughs> the one time in all of creation that the woman said less words than the man. <laughs> I kid you not, my granddaughter. I love Isla. She's my baby girl. How old is she? 20 months. She is already speaking more words and more rapidly than both of her older brothers. <laughs> and she's putting together full sentences. And it's just like, Oh, oh, man. I'm glad she gets to go back to your house sometimes. <laughs> God has gifted women with a communication, an ability to communicate that men typically don't have. Okay? Women excel in the use of their words. Men don't, typically. Okay? So, the woman blames the serpent, and then God does something. He, he lays out the curses. Okay, so here is the root of the problem that we have had since this point. Alright? Now, the curse is because of what they have done. God isn't just spitting off things because He's mad at them. Okay? This is the logical progression of how God created things to be. And when they violated this pattern, this path, this direction, this is the outcome of what happens. So the first thing he says, he says to the servant, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock 
and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now listen to this. Because right here, right in the midst of the first curse, is the first prophecy, the first promise. Okay? He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now see, right here in the midst of the cursings that God is laying out, He's already preparing man for redemption. Because the word seed there is not plural. It's singular. It's one. He's saying that from Eve will come one who will bruise the serpent's head. Okay? Now, he says to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire for, shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. <clears throat> so, now there's, there's a, just in this passage, there's a whole series of sermons. And we're not going to touch on those today. Next year, we're going to talk about family matters. And we're going to talk about how this entire dynamic changed the way men and women look at and deal with each other. Because it's significant. Okay? So, <clears throat> we see that God has brought this curse upon man. Actually, man brought the curse upon himself. God's just telling him what he has reaped. Okay? And, but in the midst of it, there's this promise. So, the first thing that we see is man messed up. Mankind. And has received... Both a curse and a promise. Now, if you notice, it says um, at the end of verse 19, he says, um, Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. This is the first, the first death that we really see, the, the promise of death. Now, we, we heard before that for you will surely die, but Adam and Eve had no idea what die meant. That would be like if I told you, you will surely for hooba gas. <laughs> Not that. But they didn't know what it meant. And God's telling man right here, He says, you, I, I made you out of the dust, and you will return to the dust. This life will end. This body that you have, this life that you're living that you know will be gone. You will return to the dust. Okay, so we see this. This is the logical outcome of sinning. Okay? So the first prophecy... Genesis 3.15, God promises that a Messiah will be born. But not just that a Messiah would be born, but if you notice, He spoke, said that the woman's seed. So it is going to come from a woman, but He doesn't say anything about a man. Because see, God wasn't working this out as He went. He already knew what the plan was. Okay. Now we're going to jump way up to Isaiah chapter 7. Don't, don't turn. I'm going to hit a bunch of these verses. Write them down. You can, you can look them up later. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Isaiah is speaking. He says, Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. Okay? So, not only do we know that, that the child is going to come from the woman, but, but at first it's supposed that man would be involved, right? I mean, that's how children are born. Man and woman equals child. Okay? But, well, you know, some women would say man and woman equals two child because they don't think the man ever grows out of that. <laughs> but we have this, this idea that but, but then God speaks through Isaiah and He says, no, you know what? Man's not going to be involved in this. Now, there are 
physiological reasons, there are biological reasons that I believe that God created man, that God created Jesus without man's intervention. I believe that God, by the way he designed things, determined that it couldn't be. Okay? So, we see that the Messiah, the one that's going to come, that's going to bruise the serpent's head, is going to be born of a virgin. So it's got to be a woman, it's got to be a virgin. Okay? But, but then God doesn't end it just there. God gets very specific, and He's very precise in how He does things. Okay? That's one of the things that amazes me the most about the book of Revelation. Because in Revelation it says that God pulls out the full measure of His wrath, right? And yet the full measure of His wrath is very carefully portioned one-third of the trees, one-third of the water, one-third of the crops and the animals. Everything is very carefully measured by how He does it because God doesn't do anything just willy-nilly like we do. We don't, he doesn't just roll the dice. Everything is carefully considered and thought out. So there you go, free spirits. God's a nerd. <laughs> For those of you that don't know the difference there, my wife is a free spirit and I am like the president of the nerds club. And, uh, so we're always teasing back and forth about being nerd and being free spirit. She says, you know, I, 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 she's been put into my life to help me loosen up a little bit, but she doesn't know that I plan all my spontaneity. So, <laughs> so that's with the help of the Holy Free Spirit. That's right, that's, that's yes. So, but God's plan was more than just a woman, more than just a virgin, because we see in uh, Genesis chapter 12, God calls out of all the people on the earth, He calls one man. He calls Abram. And He tells him, He says, I want you to pack up, I want you to leave, you go to a place I'll show you. Just get up and go. And so, Abram got up, and went. Now God established with Abram a covenant where God said, I will be your God. Singular, not plural. Okay. Now you got to think about this because at that time it was a polytheistic society where they had gods for everything, very, very animistic probably, where they say, okay, you know, the wind's blowing, so there's got to be something that causes the wind to blow, so there's got to be a God that blows the wind. Well, there's lightning. There's got to be a God that, that hurls the lightning. And there's, there's water. And there's got to be a God. And, and so for God to make a covenant, covenant with Abram and say, I will be your God, singular, which is in and of itself is a really cool thing because the word that is used is actually a, a singular composed of parts. Okay, It's not just one thing like I would say, I have a pen. Really, this is more than just a pen, isn't it? Because you've got a clicker, you've got the shell, and you've got the tube full of ink. You've got, you've got parts that make up the whole. That's the same idea that God is relaying to Abram here. So even in the Old Testament, we begin to see that God is revealing himself as a triune being made up of three parts. If you have any desire to get into that, to look into the, the triune nature of God, I would really recommend you see uh, Jesus, read the book, Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, there's a copy of it in the library. There's actually maybe two copies of it in the library. Uh, it's fantastic the way that the gentleman, Mino Kalisha, went back and researched how Jesus is revealed all throughout the Old Testament. And he gives a very clear presentation of the triune nature of God from Genesis through Revelation. Um, so, he chooses Abraham, Abram. And then he says to him in, in Genesis 12, verse 3, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now there's two things I want to draw out of this. First, who is of the line of Abraham? Who are his people? Israel. Israel. They are the true sons, the biological heirs, of Abraham. Now, who are the spiritual sons? We are. Anybody that believes by faith are the true sons, the, the, the spiritual sons of Abraham. So we can count him as our father as well. Just not biologically. Although I can because I got like 3% Jewish in me. Who knew? Um, so, 
But, but the second thing I want to draw out, well, let me, let me finish up on the first point. I still believe that if you curse Abraham's people, God will dishonor you. God will curse you. If you bless them, I believe God will bless you. Okay? I believe God doesn't change. I believe He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when He gave this promise to, to Abraham, I believe that's still in effect today. So be careful how you deal with God's people. Okay? Um, second thing, though, notice this. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So, not only has God chosen a woman and, and a, a virgin, but now He has chosen a specific people group through whom the Messiah will come. This promised one will come. So, uh, Genesis 22, 18, uh, God is speaking to Abraham again, and He says, In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed My voice. So, God is telling him, and he tells him not just once, but twice. So if the teacher talks to you the same thing twice, what do you do? You pay attention. You make notes. It's got to be on the test. God is telling him that through you, I am going to bless everyone. Everybody. But, but God doesn't just choose Abraham. Because Abraham had multiple children, didn't he? Not, not even just two, because after Sarah died, we know he had several more children. But of the two that were born while Sarah was alive, what's interesting in that is that God spoke through Abraham that it was going to be through his wife Sarah that the promise was going to come. But he chose of Ishmael and Isaac, he chose Isaac. And he comes and he tells Isaac, hey, I'm choosing you. We see this in uh, Genesis 21.12. But God said to Abraham, "Do not be, uh, do not, excuse me, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So the promise is given to Abraham and his seed. But God says that promise is going to flow right down through Isaac, not through Ishmael. Now Galatians makes it clear that Isaac is the child of promise." Because God had promised uh, Abraham and Sarah that they would have a child. He would give them a child. And Sarah was getting frustrated. The time was long past when she could conceive and have children. And she, she couldn't hold on for the promise. And she told Abraham, here's my servant girl, servant girl, you take her. And then the child will be mine. And that just led to all kinds of problems that we still see today. Because the Arabs come from the line of Ishmael. And God says that there will be enmity between Ishmael and Isaac. There will be conflict. We still see that going today. Okay? But not only does God say that it's going to be through Isaac, because Isaac had multiple children, didn't he? He had Esau and he had Jacob, twins, and Esau was the one that should have received the birthright. Well, he, he did receive the birthright, but he traded it for a bowl of stew. Now, we look at that and we go, so what? Because we don't understand that the firstborn received a double portion of the blessing than all the other children received just a single portion. And the firstborn became the ruler after the father. So he gave up this right, this position, this place for a bowl of stew. I hope it was good stew. So God now chooses, I'm not going to go through Esau. I've already chosen Abraham. I've already chosen Isaac. Now I'm choosing Jacob. In Numbers 24, 17, 24, 17 he says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Now, it's interesting because it says a star will come out of Jacob. What was the sign that the wise men were looking for when Jesus was born? A star. And, and it was a star that held its place over Bethlehem. Now, we look at that and we go, well, stars move. Actually, there is a... a thing 
where stars appear to stay in the same place for a certain period of time because they follow what's called a retrograde path. And the star moves from one point to the other, but because of the way the Earth moves in relation to the sun and in its axis, it almost gives the appearance that the star is going to circle back and go over the same path twice. And depending where you are in relation to that star, it looks like that star never moved. It just stays in the same spot. Isn't God cool? He invented all this stuff, he puts it all together, and then he lets us into little tiny snippets of how he makes it work. And I love when he reveals things like this, because he tells Jacob, but uh, a star shall come out of Jacob. Um, but going forward, how many children did Jacob have? How many sons did Jacob have? Come on. Twelve! Twelve! Now we got not just a, a choice between two, but we have a choice out of twelve. Who is the, who's going to be of the line? Well, God answered that as well. Genesis 49.10. Then this is um, Jacob. He's speaking over his children. He's giving them the blessing before he dies. And he's speaking to Judah. And he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now think about this for a minute. Because when Jacob is talking, that when he says the obedience of the peoples, he's not saying my people. He's not saying that Judah is going to be the ruler of just his line. He's using people in the general term where it's talking about everybody. Okay? And so when he gives this prophecy to Judah, and he says that, that the scepter will come up out of the line of Judah, who was the first king of Israel? Saul, what tribe did he come from? Ah, looks like there's a problem, doesn't it? No, because God's got it all covered. After Saul blew it, God raised up another man, David, from the tribe of Judah. And God promised to David that the Messiah would come from his line. So look how carefully that we see that God is weaving together this tapestry he has chosen a woman, but not just any woman. It's got to be a virgin. But it's not just a virgin. It's got to be a virgin of the line of Abraham, but not just Abraham, but also Isaac, and also Jacob, and now also Judah, and now not just of the tribe of Judah, but also of the lineage of David. Oh, let's look at those scriptures real quick. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, this is God speaking to, to David. He says, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish your throne of his kingdom forever. Now, the, the, the near reading of this is he's speaking of Solomon because what did Solomon do? After David died, what did Solomon do? What was his great the temple. the temple. He built the temple. Well, that seems to fit right here with this. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Well, but then there's a far call for this because did Solomon reign forever? No. But, but when Jesus came and he was in the temple and the, the disciples were pointing out all these great and beautiful things in the temple, what did Jesus say? He said something kind of interesting. As a matter of fact, it was the one thing that they were able to accuse him of, albeit in a different understanding. He said, I tell you the truth. Tear all these stones down, and I will build them again in three days. Because Jesus was relaying an important truth that we don't really grasp in our heads. He wasn't talking about a physical temple. He was talking about his body. Okay, And his temple, the house that God built, is the body of Jesus Christ who is in a glorified state, who is the Son of God, who is God, but who is at the same time, uh, the Scripture tells us that He is a man in heaven interceding on our behalf. The man, Jesus. Okay? So there's, there's that hypostatic union between the perfect God and man that Jesus now exists in where He is fully God and fully man. Remember? Fully God, fully man. Okay. So, we see that there is a far-off prophecy that is given here 
But let's look at uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, because this one goes even clearer. It says, Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. See, Isaiah is, is calling back that prophecy and he's saying God is going to raise up from the line of David, just as he promised David, a godly king who will rule forever. Okay, so now we've got this, this chain is narrowing down and narrowing down and narrowing down. But God doesn't just give us the particulars of the lineage, where, where he's going to come. He gives us more intimate particulars. He tells us where it's going to take place. Okay, he says in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, he says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, of, uh, from ancient days. See, that this is Micah speaking through the power of the Spirit, speaking through God's instruction, is saying, okay, I've already told you that, that the Messiah is coming. He's going to come from Abraham. He's going to come from Isaac. He's going to come from Jacob. He's going to come from Judah. He's going to come from David. Now I'm going to give you the location. Now I don't understand this, except that we have God's Spirit that opens our eyes to this, and we also are looking back on something that has already happened. But it seems to me that when this prophecy came forth, they would have set up a watchtower in Bethlehem. You would want to know what's going on in Bethlehem. But when Jesus comes, they're oblivious. They, they, they're not even aware. Because the wise men come and they say, well, you know, we're looking for where the king is to be born. And, and they have to go back to the, the wise men. The wise men get back and they say, oh, it's Bethlehem. Well, the wise men already knew that the king was born. The, the people in Israel were oblivious. Okay? So God gives them a promise. He tells them the location, but he, he goes beyond this. And this is actually one of those things that's a little bit scary. God looking down through eternity, he sees that the king on the throne of that time, Herod, called Herod the Great, not, not because he was a great king, but because he was a great builder. He sees that, that Herod is going to do everything he can to expunge the rightful heir, the rightful king, to sustain his own line. And so another prophecy comes forth. And this one is actually something that's, that's a little bit heartrending. Because in Jeremiah 31, verse 15, it says, Thus says the Lord, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children, and she refuses to be comforted for her children, because they are no more. And we know that this prophecy was fulfilled because when Herod found out that the wise men had given him the slip and they'd snuck away, he knew that the time of the stars appearing was about two years, so he gave a command. He said, I want you to go to that area. Go to the area of Bethlehem, and I want you to wipe out any male child two years old or younger. And that scripture comes to life, and it says, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And that's, that's one of those things where God is looking down and he's seeing the sin and the corruption of man and he sees how man is going to try and influence and affect his plan. God protects him because that very night before all of this happened, God had an angel appear to Joseph and, and guess what? Joseph went where? Egypt. Egypt. But, but did you know that was prophetic as well? That's another prophecy. Because God says not only is a child going to be born in Bethlehem, not only is there going to be an incredible massacre, the decimation, not even decimation, the, the, the annihilation of every male child two years and under, but he says that uh, his son is going to come out of Egypt. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And so we see that when Jesus was uh, threatened, God had the angel appear, took him to Egypt. They stayed there until Herod died, and then they came back. They came back to Nazareth, which was where Joseph's family lived. 
and, and God established him there. And out of Egypt, he called his son. So, you know, there's, there's so many things that, you know, I, I made the comment about Bethlehem. But quite honestly, there are so many things in Scripture that are prophetic that we don't even realize are prophetic. Sometimes Jesus will do something and they will say, this was to fulfill the prophecy. And I go back and I look where the prophecy is. And it fits right in with what they're saying. And I go, I didn't know that was a prophecy. So, we see that God had a plan. And this plan was spread over millennia. Because God said at the beginning, there's going to be hope. Because there's going to be a, a man born of a woman, of a virgin, who will bruise the serpent's head. He's going to pop the serpent's head. Okay? But, but God takes that plan and he starts to narrow the parameters and narrow the parameters. Was that for his sake? No, that was for our sake. So that we would understand, so we could look back on things and go, ah, the hand of God was on this. He said, hey, look, I'm choosing Abraham. Out of all the people of the earth, I'm going to choose Abraham. I am going to make him mine and I will be his God. Why? For what purpose? That through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, David and Solomon were great kings. But were all the nations of the earth blessed because of them? <clears throat> no, not really. Because you look at some of the kingdoms that they threw down and they enslaved, enslaved their entire population and put them to work building all the great things that they built. So not all of the earth was blessed because of them. Okay? But he said, not only through, through Abraham, but I'm going to choose Isaac because this is the child of my promise. This is the one that I have promised to Abraham and Sarah will be my gift to them. And that through this line, I'm going to carry that, that promise to Abraham. But not just through Isaac, but through Jacob, who, who should have not been the, the blessed child. That should have been Esau. Jacob should have been the second one, the follower. But God reversed that order and, and, and made Jacob the one that received and inherited the promise. And by the way, just so you know, Esau had descendants that married Ishmael's descendants. And that's where the Arab people come from. That's why it's the fulfillment of the prophecy, the conflict not just between uh, Ishmael and Isaac, but also between Esau and Jacob. So keep your eyes open. If you really want to know what's going on with regards to Scripture, look with an Israel focus, not an American focus. Okay? Because this was not written to be American-centric. This was written to be Israel-centric. Keep an eye on what's going on over there. Um, but not only was he going to come through... Jacob, but he was going to come through the line and the tribe of Judah, but not just through Judah. He's going to come through the, the family of Jesse and David. And not only am I giving you that, but I'm going to tell you that he's going to be born in Bethlehem and that one of the signs of his birth is going to be the massacre of all the children in Bethlehem. And yet not only this, now, now, because if you were trying to piece this together before, you'd look at this and go, well, how in the world can he be born in Bethlehem but be called out of Egypt? Okay, This is what I do with a lot with the New Testament stuff. I look at these things and I go, how can A be the same as B when they don't equal the same thing? Well, God's got his own way of working things out. He doesn't need my approval. Okay, He makes the prophecies because he knows how it's going to happen. So when he said the child would be born in Bethlehem and yet he would call his son out of Egypt, the, I can look at the, the people looking at the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, and going, well, this doesn't seem to make sense. And yet God managed to do it, didn't he? And so he came out of Egypt. So, but, but see, not only did God give us who and where, if you have your Bible, flip with me to Isaiah 53 because he has the why as well. And we're going to look at that today. <clears throat> Isaiah 53. I'm, I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to go back and pick out a couple of verses. Because see, we have the who... We have the where, we even have the what, but now we're getting to the why. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a, sh a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. <clears throat> and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So there's a couple things that I want to point out. First, um, we celebrate Christmas. You know, it's interesting. I hear people talk about, oh, well, you know, Christmas uh, was, was originally one of the festivals and, and we shouldn't celebrate and we shouldn't. Uh, to, to all of that, I say, ooh. Scripture makes it clear in Colossians that whatever we, we do, whether we celebrate the New Moon fe Feast or the Sabbath or some other celebration, we do it unto God. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, um, celebrate Christmas, but celebrate it with a right understanding. Okay? Um, don't get so caught up in the tinsels and the lights and the trees and the, the elves and, and all of that stuff that you completely forsake, that you completely miss what this is really all about. Because see, this is the birth of our hope. This is the birth of what we just read. Now, now the church originally instituted the celebration of Christmas because they were getting to the point where they had deified Christ so much, so much that the church had lost his humanity. And there were even people that were saying that he didn't have a physical body. He was not a corporeal entity. So, so they were, you know, he was just God and, and he just went through the motions, but he wasn't really one of us. And so the church determined, the church fathers determined, we're going to start celebrating his birth so that people will understand he was a man like us and yet knew no sin. And so they emphasized his birth and not just his death. Okay, Because without the birth, there could be no death. Okay, And so the, the death is, is the, the pivot, the fulcrum upon which all of our faith rests and yet without the birth there could be no death okay so celebrate absolutely celebrate but celebrate with the right understanding because this is what's happening he is abused he was crushed he was pierced for our iniquities and it was his wounds that brought my healing he was cut off from the land of the living stricken for the transgressions of my people. That, that's us. He, he even gives us a clue as to where he's going to be buried because he says, uh, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. And that's, that's more of one that we'll talk about 
uh, come Resurrection Sunday. But it was God's will to crush him. To make his soul an offering for guilt. God is going to bless him. God is going to raise him up. He's going to bless him because he poured out his soul to death as was numbered with the transgression, and look at the very last statement in this chapter. He bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Christ has taken himself, his birth, his life, his death, he has placed himself right in between us and God. And all the righteous wrath and fury of God was poured out on him. It was not passed down to us to whom it belonged. And yet, in the same way, all the blessing and the, the love and the adoration and the many manifold blessings of God pour right through Jesus Christ and come to us undiminished. And so if that's not something we're celebrating, I don't know what is. So I would encourage you this holiday, okay? Celebrate. Have joy. Have cheer. Spread joy and cheer. But do it with a right understanding of what we're celebrating. We are celebrating our great hope. The fulfillment of our great hope. And as we wait for His coming again to receive the fulfillment of all that was promised, we celebrate not just that birth 2,000 plus years ago, but we celebrate the second coming some point in the not too distant future. Because even as Scripture says, even so Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen? Amen. 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 So, at the start of the Christmas season, let's get our minds right. Let's set our, our hearts and our minds on things above because there's a lot of noise going on out there. There's a lot of people that want your attention because they want your money. Uh, let me share you this. We just finished our series on money. If you go into debt buying Christmas presents, shame on you. Okay? Shame on you. If you spend beyond your means to buy a gift that a year from now they're not going to remember what it was, shame on you. Be good stewards of God's money. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, we bless you this morning and we thank you because you are an awesome God. Father, you have laid out the trail that leads us right to Bethlehem. Father, you have declared the path that took us all the way to the cross at Golgotha. And Father, you have set out a path for us to follow until the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And we thank you and we honor you. And we bless you because you have not only made a way that Jesus has taken our sins from us, but you have sent your Holy Spirit to be our counselor, our comforter, our teacher, and our guide. And we honor you and we bless you this morning. And I ask, Lord God, that as we celebrate this Christmas season, that we would do it with right thinking, with a right understanding, and Father, full of appreciation and adoration for you. And we bless you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>